I think we can just start, huh? Okay. So, first of all, I, I would like to ask you something. Try to imagine the world in which everything that you do, everywhere that you move, every email that you send, every search that you make on, on Google, for example, if you are watching some kind of movies that are maybe not uh, so, uh, you know, like uh, that you should not share with other people, or that someone knows every time when you send SMS to who you send SMS and basically everything that you search, everything that you do. We are like, you know, like uh, technology in our life became like something that is like completely part of our everyday life. You know, it's extension of our body in some way. And most of the social relation, most of the communication, most of things that we do, it's some somehow mediated through technology. How many of you have a, a smart mobile phone? Please raise a hand. Who is using the internet? Okay. In there is one law that's going to be introduced in like uh, I think really soon that will el enable the secret service, government, police to know everything more or less everything what you do through technology. And we are going to speak now uh, about that law. We are going to try to understand the implications of that law. And we are trying to somehow see what we are going to do with that. So we have a few people, friends, who join us to, to speak on that topic. Maybe, OK, let's introduce one by one. Hi, I'm Stefan. Um, I'm with Telecomics, and we had this situation Vladan described uh, earlier in Syria, and I was in the group who revealed what the Syrian government was doing, at least with uh, data from the internet. And um, yeah, so um, I can talk about this, and maybe I have some other ideas on this law, but pass on. Um, I'm Mariani Dobroshi. I'm, uh, I work with Flask normally. Uh, and uh, I've been uh, an activist against this uh, draft law. Hello, uh, I'm Kitura Kusari. I work for Balkan Investigative Reporting Network as a legal advisor. I have monitored this law from the moment they started to draft it, and I have advocated against it. You know me, right? Okay. I would just like to say, in this context, I am an activist against surveillance. Uh, and also somebody who's trying to say it's not just about the surveillance. Okay, let's try first to understand what this law is about. Yeah, so, so if I may just go through the steps that, uh, that uh, the draft law took until, until today and what the situation is today, and then we're going to go back to uh, what it means and wha what are the concepts about. So there were three efforts to send these, this type of law to the parliament, Actually, uh, we are a unique country in Europe in not having this kind of law. So we are kind of in a, in a good position. It's very unique in the world uh, not to have mass surveillance, uh, especially in the, you know, including the Western societies. So, so um, there were three efforts. The latest one uh, started in March of this year. And that's when the, um, the draft law that was being um, uh, discussed with the European Union, with the European Commission, um, came back to Kosovo with the seal of approval from the European Commission. And the um, Ministry of European Integration, which had uh, drafted the law, China, uh, came back to the civil society, certain people in the so civil society, they were not really public about it, and they said, okay, this is our this is what we are going to send to the parliament. Uh, what do you think? Uh, so in the first draft, uh, I'm going just to go over the main things that, that were part of it. 
or yeah, the first uh, first draft or the first time the law came, draft law, it said um, uh, it had one interface and it was going to be done by the intelligence agency. So they were kind of the gatekeepers of who had the chance to access this uh, uh, data and metadata that was going to be uh, retained and access to, to the law. And it also had, so blanket met metadata retention for 12 months. That means that uh, for 12 months, everything that you do on the internet and on your phone, uh, the metadata was going to be stored. And another problem was the author author uh, authorized institutions. So it basically said the intelligence agency has the right to access it and the um, the, the uh, security agencies, the other agencies, the police, and uh, some other agencies had, uh, like the customs and other agencies had rights to access, but also it left the door open for any other agency in the future that, you know, that could be based, based on some uh, future law. So there was a lot of pushback, and then on the um, 8th of April, just a day before the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, came with a very important uh, uh, verdict on metadata uh, sur uh, retention, uh, the ministry sent out a new uh, draft, and then again, it, this this also maintains the the a separate uh, interface from the from the intelligence agency. The uniqueness here now is that there is a there is a separate process, so the intelligence agency gets their own interface, but uh, the um, uh, so for their own use, but also the police and other agencies uh, go through the uh, you know through their own. Uh I, I will just stop you for yeah. a second, just just to make clear uh, what is metadata. Okay, just okay. You have a mobile phone, okay, who is like working, and uh, every time when you send someone a message or speak with someone in order to for this communication to happen okay between two human beings two two people some data need to be produced okay and this data it's like a sta it's like on the when you are sending a i don't know a letter with on envelope it's written to who who written the 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 mail to who it's going on on what time it's made and on which location, okay? And also, it's it's written in this metadata, for example, for the mobile phones, it's written the type of the mobile phone that you use. So now we are speaking, basically, who have a right and how to access all of these data that are all the time produced. So they are produced, maybe because technology is made like that, we are not so able to, to you know, to, to live without the data, but it's a question who on which way have a right to access this information about you. Uh, so metadata, data about the data. When did you com communicate to whom and how long the co conversation took, but it doesn't actually say um, what did you say to that person. So that's, that's metadata. We'll, we'll talk uh, later what this means. So, um, Still, uh, blanket metadata, this is 7th of uh, um, April. The metadata surveillance is, is re uh, maintained and, you know, in, in full scale according to actually the European directive. There was a European directive in force in the EU. It was not being implemented in all of the EU countries, but nevertheless, this was uh, you know, a European uh, legislation. On the 8th of April, the Court of Justice basically throws out the European directive, and now for Kosovo, there is no more um, there is no more rationale. Um, so, and then we get a final a final version on the um, on the 27th of April, I believe. We get a, a, a final draft, and the, the uh, message from the ministry that this is what they are going to send to the parliament. Lucky for us. Um, soon after the parliament disbands and uh, so they cannot consider the draft although they did intend to send this draft to the parliament and what this uh, third draft says so what is going to come back again i think um 
once you um, uh, what, once the parliament convenes again, I think it's going to be priority legislation. AKI maintains, the, the intelligence agency maintains its own interface. Um, the warrant is mandatory, but with AKI having their own kind of listening device on the, on, the, on the wires, you cannot really say whether, you know, how much they are recording and what are they doing with it. So it really doesn't matter. For the intelligence agency, they get a, a blanket access, I think. And uh, you, you also get metadata surveillance again. Ironically, the, the uh, metadata retention, I should say, is maintained, but in a, in a kind of lighter version. So um, my guess is that this version is going to come back and uh, Stefan Füle, which is the commissioner in charge for, uh, uh, has said so that they intend to push again this, this draft law in Kosovo. So with that, I will uh, give the word to my colleague here to continue. Thank you. It's always difficult to it's always difficult to make a presentation which uh, involves legal issues. For most of people, especially those who are not lawyer, lawyers, law is boring. Now, I'll try, I'll try to, to share my experience uh, I've had in Bern with this law and also data protection a agency uh, in a more interesting way. Um, now, technology has become part of our life. Sometimes I have the feeling that everybody thinks we're becoming expert. We're becoming experts in using equipment. Laptops, smartphones, tablets, we all have it and we use it. But I believe most of people, especially those uh, who are not lawyers or who are not very interested in, in uh, uh, legal issues, don't read terms and conditions, those conditions that they agree just by clicking. Most of us, we just, uh, we just uh, agree to, to, to uh, terms and conditions that you, uh, different social platforms put there just because we, on, we want to have access and we want to use that platform, platform. As a result, we decide, even though we are not aware very well what we're deciding, to publish all information, all data, all protect, all uh, information that is related to us, personal information. When joining a social network, we're likely to spend more time choosing profile picture rather than reading those lengthy documents uh, that they, they have uh, written in order for us to, to understand what we are agreeing to. While we face a lot of discoveries and inventions related to uh, technology, uh, what we are missing I believe it's lack of awareness. Lack of awareness how this technology is impacting our life. I'm not going to speak here about NSA, WikiLeaks, or other world events that we all know about, but I will stick to what's happening in Kosovo. Ariane started to, uh, Ariane started to, to talk about this draft law that we're having. Uh, it's a battle we're going on for three years now and it's not finishing. Microphone, okay. Um, now, uh, currently, interception is regulated partially with criminal procedural code, which means oh, when, uh, when prosecution or police decide to, to intercept somebody, they have kind of legal base. How long they can intercept us, the reason, how, etc. But we're lacking a, a law, a specific law uh, regarding interception. Now, the, the European Commission, which b basically rules here, they suggested us that we need to have a specific law because this is a practice in Europe. We started to draft a law three years ago. Uh, it was a very bad, uh, badly written law, and it stopped for some reason. And then it went back again three years after, and the, the reason actually b why that law uh, was not approved in the, that draft law was not approved in the parliament, it was because it didn't make a distinction between interception that are, are done for court reasons and for judicial reasons and interception that are done for, for intelligence purposes. Um, now we have another draft law. 
and the, 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 the job law that we're having is still problematic. And there are three reasons why this, this uh, law is uh, problematic. Arya Nit mentioned the first one is because it authorizes unlimited institutions to have access in interceptions. Access to such sensitive data should be granted only to specialized institutions. Uh, while I was doing research about this draft law, uh, I based my research on a, on, on, on a law that is in, in uh, UK, and that is Regulation on, on Investigative Powers Act, and I believe we should follow that example, which lists all the institutions that enjoy access to interception and does not leave any option for the number of such institutions to increase. Here it's open, it's unlimited, and it gives you the possibility that the list of institutions that might have access in the future can change any time the parliament decides to. Secondly, the, the, the second problem with the law is the law foresees for the national security purposes that Kosovo intelligence agencies shall have an interception interface placed within their premises. Basically, the, co the equipment that enables them to, um, to have access to our data, they want to have one in their premises. We asked them why they didn't give, give an, any answer. We asked the uh, Ministry of, Inter uh, of European Integration, and they said it's for security reason without explaining in great detail why would they do that. The third problem with this law is if we suspect we're being intercepted illegally, to whom should we address? Where do we complain? There isn't any mechanism offering us the possibility to complain. In the United Kingdom, there is a, a specialized body which deals with, with that. Um, another issue related to the procedure for this draft law is that the Ministry of uh, European Integration knew that there were some people interested in this law and they were working in a very sneaky way, away from the eyes of operators, those telecommunication operators, those who are actually going to implement this law, and of course, away from the eyes of civil society because they knew that, that might be, they might be criticized. What we do in cases when we advocate and it, it, turns, to be, it turns to be a failure because me, very often we go to parliament, we go to government, we complain, we send letters, and they do nothing. Then what we do is we go to European Commission, and this is what we did with this law. We went there, we complained, and after many, many weeks, they said, it fulfills minimum criteria. And they said it should, it's okay, it should go to the parliament. We raised this issue in every single conference with every single stakeholders. And we, w we had one question for all institutions. Tell us one, one country, a democratic country, which have this kind of law where the, uh, this interface is placed within the secret uh, uh, intelligence and they didn't have any. They said, we are sui generis and we will have a law sui generis. Uh, and this is why we objected, we objected the law. Currently, as uh, uh, Adrian said, uh, the law has been stopped, is within the prime minister office and they're waiting for the parliament to, uh, be, uh, to, to, to start its work. But at the same time, the European Commission changed its mind and they said that it's wrong and we have to review this law. Um, we, uh, the, the, second, the second thing, but very shortly, we're, I just want to, to mention how important for us is this data protection agency, which has been established four years ago. And we've tested it, and maybe during the, our, our uh, discussion, I'll have a chance to speak more about them. Uh, we have a data protection agency, which is protecting the interest of a ruling party, PDK, because they have been elected by them, but it's not uh, protecting our data. Uh, we need to, to, to raise awareness of people about the importance of our data, and we need also to be uh, more, uh, to advocate more how to protect our data. Otherwise, uh, we, will we will end up having bad reg uh, laws, bad regulation, which will endanger our personal data. Whew, great. <laughs> okay, uh, so, Surveillance is basically there, okay, and uh, and okay. On one side, there is like a argument 
like, okay, we need to collect some data in order to protect our citizens from the terrorists, from, I don't know, a lot of different things, from, <laughs> from the Germans, <laughs> okay? And, okay, on the other side, that's one side. The other side, it's our, it's our privacy, you know, like, and basically what, what some of the, the, the world influential, like, uh, uh, civil rights organizations are trying to propose is that there should be a balance, okay? So in, if you really need to hunt for someone, okay, then it should be some kind of uh, uh, legal way how to proceed with that. This should be a court order and okay. But what, sh what you should not do, it's to do like uh, mass surveillance. And from my point of view, uh, uh, data retention is basically a, a, a form of mass surveillance because you are retaining the data of all citizens. So there is like, I don't know how many millions of people living in Kosovo. Instead of like chasing five of them that are wrong, you will for any case like keep all the data, you know, you never know. But from w what do you think like uh, Dan or, or, or Stefan, like is there a, like a balance or should we like, uh, try to 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 go in that direction or 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 something else um yeah well what what i heard it is mass surveillance yes um it's not about privacy i don't believe in privacy it's a bourgeois concept but uh, the thing is that a state should not surveil the people living in the state it's just basic thing of democracy um so the the whole um law, we, we had this fight against such laws in Europe uh, in several countries. We had it in, in Austria and um, there the federal court said no, it's not legal, for example. And um, we still have, uh, we had this in Germany where the federal court said, okay, you can do this, but not like you do it now. And um, we have this fight in many countries in Europe. Um, on the other hand, it's, uh, we have to ask a question, why does the state want to surveil? And normally it's about security of the people and uh, counter-terrorism and everything, which is utterly wrong. It's not about counter-terrorism, it's about power. It's about keeping and remaining power over the people. The people who elected the government shall be reigned. <laughs> and you can do this by collecting data. And yes, it's even easier with the metadata than reading each email, but I know that you've been at this point calling this person and yeah, you are just guilty. Uh, I think like Edward Snowden said in like some of the latest talk that for him as a, when he was like working in NSA, uh, for him metadata was more uh, uh, valuable than the content because metadata cannot lie. Yeah. yeah, metadata cannot lie, and if you analyze metadata, you can see not only that we were having a phone call, but with whom you called, with whom me I called, and you can rebuild social networks of people, and yeah, it's much more easy to get inside those networks if you know how they are existing. So, yes, uh, metadata is way more um, ah, I'm missing the words, great. <laughs> yeah, ma ma intrusive. Ma intrusive. Yeah, to collect it, it's much more intrusive than reading one letter or one email or listening to one phone call. Um, it's basically our, our, lay, our whole life is metadata. If I walk around here, even if I'm not doing phone calls, uh, the, the mobile provider will know where I am, and this is metadata as well. Even if I'm in the woods, where there's no connection, then they know where they lost my signal and where it got back into the network. So they could make a trace of my way, for example. Um, so, but, okay, the, I don't, this is probably the hardest question, but, okay, how we can deal, the, because the most of the time when you start to, like you're speaking in cafe with someone, you're drinking and like speaking about this surveillance, and then most of the time people are saying, yeah, but I don't have anything to hide. Okay, this is like the argument most of the time. So, if some of you have a like a wish to answer to I don't have anything to hide argument. 
I'd just like to point out that I don't have anything to hide. <coughs> Not really. Um, okay, I'd just like to, to add a point about the previous discussion as well. I think we, we I absolutely support the campaign of Arianet and Flutera to, to contest this stuff in law, because it's one of the ways we have to try and grasp back something from this power situation that I think Stefan totally correctly analyzed. But let's be clear, right? Their pants are completely showing, right? This is completely obvious bullshit now. What they say they use this data for, we know, as Stefan was saying, what they use this data for, right? Commercial competition, spying on people whose politics they don't like. We know why all this stuff is used, okay? So we don't need to take any notice of what they say it's for and worry about this uh, abstract concept of balance. We know there's no such thing. They don't give a whatever, about balance, okay? But we should still fight it on that basis. But the other thing I want to say, which speaks to the idea of do you have anything to worry about, is something that I, I know a bit more about, maybe, than the surveillance technology as such, is the metadata and what it's used for, because it's used by all those other people, the Facebooks and the everything else's. All the metadata is now big data. All the big data has patterns in, which you can find, right? Through machine learning, you find correlations, and then you make decisions. Are you gonna get a loan? Right, you've got all these companies in the UK, you phone them, 10 minutes later they tell you, have you got a loan? You need some money? Have you got a loan? Right? That decision isn't based on what you did. You've got nothing to hide. It's based on whether your friends pay back their loans. Okay? That's because this stuff can be connected in larger patterns. So it doesn't matter whether you think you personally have got anything to hide or not. It's the uses to which this larger data is going to be put. And a lot of the time, forget transparency, the people running these algorithms, they don't even know why the answers come. The algorithms themselves don't come with explanations. It just says, hey, there's a pattern here. This guy clearly can't be trusted. Why can't he be trusted? I don't know, but don't let him fly on a plane. I'm not shitting you. That happens in the States. People are on no-fly lists for reasons that they don't know, and for reasons that I believe, the people who put them on no-fly lists don't even know, but they're on the list. Yeah, that's this kind of pre-cog situation when they are able to like analyze something and then make decisions, yeah, pre-crime. Like make this like some kind of uh, projection. What will happen? Yes. Sir. Yeah. So that means is that uh, in the future it could be used, and they tell us that oh, if you don't do anything wrong, if we have nothing to suspect you for, uh, we're not going to access that data. So okay, I'll suggest an alternative. Let's uh, something similar. Let's put a camera on your bedroom. It's going to be stored, encrypted into my server. And I, I um, trust me, I'm not going to be use, uh, use that against you because it's going to be encrypted and everything. And of course, I'm a nice guy. So would you do that? Of course not, uh, it, because you know that I'm going to use that. And th that's, what, uh, that's what happens. And the other thing is, um, so um, um, if you don't believe that metadata is really dangerous, hand me all your uh, phone records for, for the last 30 days. I want to see who you are talking to. And I want to see all the IP addresses and times you, you have visited those IP addresses from your computer. If you don't have nothing to hide, okay, don't hide it even from me. Why would you trust a government official and not trust me, uh, your friend? I've had this argument with, with friends, so. Um. I like the idea of a government not harming people. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's always this. If you don't have, if you don't have anything to hide, so why hide it? Um, the point is, as I said earlier, it's about the power, because uh, yeah, if you if you if you uh, behave lawful and don't make anything bad, then and everything is fine for you. Yeah, but this is control. It's it's about power and control. So um, if, if in Germany we had the state of retention, um, I'm sure that many people would not act in political ways like they do today. And it's, that's, yeah, data retention is, is pest for democracy. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's really killing democracy if you, if you, if you save this data. And um, the worst thing after all is that in most cases, it's all about intelligence services and, and, and not about police. So uh, even in this proposal you, you read, uh, you, you talked about, it's that uh, the intelligence service of the Kosovo gets this um, uh, this API and not the police. And intelligence services are always 
working in a military way, not in a civil way, which makes, makes it even more dangerous. Yeah, but okay, the, 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 the problem of the technology, if you're speaking about the mobile phones for the moment, this data need to exist, okay? And then the option, because there is, I'm not so sure that there is like something like a, a embedded in design that probably it can be made to be deleted immediately. But basically then you are putting trust on telecom companies and I'm, it's pity that we don't have someone from uh, a, a telecom company in this discussion. But the question is, okay, then you need to trust the telecom company to delete data. And this is when you really need to have like uh, someone, you know, someone also doing monitoring on, on telecom companies, no? It's not just pushing the government. But it starts with the government. Yep. So the government should not save my data and they should enforce law that, for example, telecom companies need to delete data. When we were advocating for this law, one of the arguments that uh, Kosovo Intelligence Agency and Ministry were, was using is that why would you trust more to a telecommunication company rather than to your own institutions? Well, my argument is that it's better to have our data in one place rather than in several places. You know, if you have it there and then you have a data protection agency which they're supposed to pro protect our data but still they don't do it, still you have le less uh, chances for those data to become more public. And then again, if you have it in one place, then you would know to whom you should address, for whom to complain. But if you have it in the in police station, if you have it in, in intelligence service, if you have it in telecommunication compa company, then there is no way you can find out who, uh, who would uh, disclose those data. And okay, so can we just try to, to, to look like a bit more into the future. Now, un until I, I don't know, now we are starting to be aware that we are like under total surveillance related to like digital uh, environment, no? Starting to be, you know, it's starting on like events like this and like Snowden things, okay? But if we, if we start, if we accept this as a, as a, as a reality, what is going to, to be, from your, your point of view, like potential chilling effect of life under s total surveillance, you know? So. Um, in history, we had this total surveillance state already. Uh, Eastern Germany, about uh, 4.5 million people were spying on each other. And people just did not went to events. They were not talking out loud what they really thought about politics. They were a gray mass. And this is what's happening if a society is surveilled. And if you are on one of the, yeah, on the bottom line of it or at the, on the top of the, the gray mass, you will try to go inside of the mass and not, well, um, yeah, that, that they don't see you. And this is, yeah, this is not only bad for democracy, but this is bad for a whole society. When artists who are doing subversal art going to jail because they do the subversal art, because they talked before with the person who is, for example, a well-known leftist, this can't be a good idea. And this is a chilling effect of it, that, yeah, people do not say anymore what they really think. Um. So I think electronic surveillance is worse than uh, human uh, surveillance uh, because you could see who's following you. You can turn around and look at the person. Um, with, with electronic surveillance, you are, you are uh, carrying a spying device in, on your pocket. So anywhere you go, the, um, the um, electronic company will know where, where you are, even without having having the the device uh, i mean the having somebody following you and it's going on all the time so it's just a matter of them uh choosing what to access when and it's all there for the, for the taking so it's way worse than than eastern germany 
the difference here right now is that, of course, you don't have an oppressive regime that is going to use that against you, but that's the only thing missing. It's uh, the, the surveillance part is way worse. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, just following, following on from both of those thoughts about uh, the relationship between spying. Oh yeah, look, my spies just turned itself on. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. What I think is super weird now about this, uh, there's a nice visualization about how big the, the uh, uh, Stasi filing cabinet would have to be in order to carry all the stuff that's now recorded every day by metadata. And it's just a funny visualization because it's about the size of Europe. Although we actually know how big the filing cabinet is because you can see the building they're building in Utah to store all the stuff, right? So you can see how big the filing cabinet's gonna be. But what I think is really weird now, as a detail of this, it's not about figuring out what the government doesn't want you to say or what the government doesn't want you to think. It's also about figuring out what the computer program is gonna think that you think. It's about the algorithms. That's super weird, right? I teach computing sometimes, okay? And there's a big push in the UK at the moment. Let's teach all the kids to do computing because then we might have some kind of business future because everything else seems pretty balked, right? We're gonna have to learn about computing just in order to figure out what the algorithm thinks we're thinking, right? This is a very creepy future. Maybe like it, let's try in, in this moment to to hear is there any question on this topic? No. Chilling effect is already there. <laughs> okay, fate. I know again the all the people who will ask something. <laughs> Okay, she wants to hear the utopian vision of, of Okay. Um, good question. So, uh, hey, let's. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you think. <laughs> um, so, um, I think it's the decentralized version, so where you don't control. So surveillance is already possible. It has been for thousands of years, but it's just very hard to manage it. It takes a lot of human effort to, to make it possible. So if you make it hard again, it's going to be way too difficult. And so yes, then again, you will be able to surveil. We're not saying that there shouldn't be surveillance at all. I think we made that clear in the fight against terrorism or whatever, uh, fighting serious crime and all of that, you're going to be able to do that still. But it's just going to, the, the effort that the government is going to take is way higher, way harder. So that's, we want to make that possible again. And the way we, you do that is by decentralizing the infrastructure. We have to get rid of the, you know, the mass email server, which is, I guess, Gmail and Yahoo and, and um, Outlook. Uh, if we do that, then I think we, we've made it. Uh, so we have solutions already for some of that. Um, the the uh, electronic services are are there. Maybe we're not, you know, y yet there with with the mobile phones, but we'll find a solution there again. Uh, um, well, I. I don't see the point in the decentralized infrastructure. I see the point that I want a world where the government is not mistrusting its own people. I want a world where a government elected by the people is working for the people and not against the people. Um, I, I know in theory they should do that. <laughs> but as, as it is with theories, it doesn't work out. And um, I want a world where I can go over the street, no matter how I look, what I believe, which sex or gender I have or whatever, and no one disrespect that. Because when we start with this, then the rest is coming as well. I would like to see people who are more educated about their personal data and how those data can be misused. 
if if we have people who know better, who knows better what will happen with their data, maybe we would be able to protect ourselves better. Uh, I'm a total optimist most of the time, and one of the things I'm optimistic about is the return of the idea of the commons. And I think one of the ideas for governing infrastructure is the idea of the commons. There was a great woman who's recently died, very sadly, called Eleanor Ostrom. She won the Nobel Prize for Economics, and she won that prize for really reintroducing and re-justifying the idea of the commons. She showed that this idea, you can check it out, the tragedy of the commons. You can't have things shared in common, and it will work. You have to have it privately owned, and then rules of the market, blah, blah, blah. Right? She showed that's not true. Okay? You can have things work governed in commons. And I think that's part of the, just part of the picture, the same as the stuff that these guys have talked about, right? to a, a more positive future, and that the commons is returning all over the place. Software was a place where it returned early on, right? the idea of, uh, of the free software right? and the commons. In technology, the idea of the commons came back. It was lost from history, but now it's talked about a lot, and it's talked about in terms of energy right? and infrastructure. The idea of the commons is making a comeback. So I think, uh, yeah, utopia is on its way, right? So okay, my my little piece of utopia will be that such a like crucial infrastructure or like crucial software or things like this will be like open, so we'll be able somehow to to see and audit some parts of of this process that is happening to us that is not hidden, that is not like a secret, or things like this. But probably it's still utopia. But okay, uh, let's let's try to. The Kushrim is was making some kind of like uh, moves, special moves that we are like yeah, exchanging, and that means probably something. Okay, we should finish. Uh, let's try to to do s to see what we can do in this moment. Okay, what I'm interested now is. Okay, if you want to speak about tools, how we can protect ourselves and things like this, you you should chase some of those people after the talk, okay. not him. Some okay, but what are the next steps? Okay, the law is going to be introduced probably. Is there going to be some actions? How people can participate? Is it possible to do something? Yeah, the, the law is coming back, and with the recent uh, uh, terrorism scare, uh, it's going to be that is going to be used as, ju as a justification. The thing here is that massive surveillance doesn't work in on fighting terrorism. The NSA uh, has a $10 billion budget a year, and it hasn't discovered a single case of terrorism from zero. A single case. It, yeah, uh, surveillance can help if you know where to look for information, but if you go just by recording everyone and trying to determine who the terrorist is in the crowd, it hasn't worked in the US, and they are really good at it, believe me. So what do we do? Uh, EU clearly is not on our side, EU and the US, because they are, um, they are targets of terrorism themselves. They have introduced similar laws themselves, and uh, they don't have any interest. They don't care about my privacy here in Kosovo. Uh, they want their security in London and in Washington. So they are not our friends. Um, then we have the problem of rule of law in Kosovo, which is way different, way lower. That's what our European friends tell us. But at the same time, they're going to introduce. They want to push similar level of, or European level of. Surveillance, I'm using this a lot, you've noticed. Um, so again, we have a problem here, and they're not our friends. On top of this law, we're also getting uh, a, a SIM registration. Actually, th that is alre already in force. There was not a single, uh, or at least very little pushback against that. And they are going to, uh, they want to record IMA records as well. So that's also coming for us. And of course, this uh, privacy practice from Turkey, and they say they are very uh, proud of it. Of course, uh, you don't want to rely on Turkey for uh, privacy. And so these are these are some issues that are coming back. We have to fight. It's not a done deal. Uh, I believe that we can push again against this because this is illegal. And according to the Court of Justice of the European Union, this is illegal. So 
the European Commission sh shouldn't be pushing that and can't push it back. Okay, just shortly, con uh, the draft law most probably will go to Parliament. What we've done in the past as Bern, we've worked a lot with uh, opposition parties, and this is what we're going to do. Uh, first, we have to see who will be in opposition, but once we know it, then we'll have to, uh, if we see that they want to move on with, with this law, we'll have to work with opposition and other civil society organizations to object this law. I hope we will have European Commission backing us, because they knew now they know that the, the law uh, should not be be passed this way, but we will follow the law, we will monitor it, and we will advocate against it. Okay, but I still didn't hear what those people are going to do tomorrow. Like, so uh, how, how y is there going to be some something that you it will uh, involve? Yeah, I heard like what's bad. I heard like. Uh, what your organization is going to do, but it's like, you know, like it's these legal things, is that, that's a bit like boring for people. Is there going to be some protests or is there going to be some people on the streets or like uh, some, even some clicktivism, like click here if like you don't like to be surveillance or something like this? Well, of course, if we have more support from people, be that with a protest, be that with online campaigning or petition, whatever, it will help our cause. Because it's not the same if you are alone there. And the last public debate we were, it was, it was only myself and some people from, from STIC, because nobody else cared. And if we have only few people just you know, going around the ministry and objecting the law, it will not have the same impact as it would have with more people. So. If people want to join, one way w there are a lot of ways, and we invite them to come to our place and see for future pos possibilities. Oh, <coughs> yeah, I just wanted to say, start using encryption, right? Start using tools like Tor. Download Tor, right? Number one, download Tor. That's it, easy. Start browsing without being tracked. Organize some crypto parties. You don't need super experts, right? You can teach each other. There's loads of materials out there now how to get a bit more crypto. So, you, of course, contest this stuff on a legal basis, but don't rely on it. It's like they're going to stick to the law anyway, okay? So start protecting yourself. 